as we uh, start the uh, second half of the New Testament, we're going to look at uh, one of the books that we uh, will be studying tonight, First Thessalonians. I'm going to read a few verses from the first chapter. We're going to look at the background of this book in a moment, but uh, as I share with you some thoughts, I want to read from First Thessalonians chapter 1. It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. I want you to uh, really uh, listen to the words as Paul writes to a church that he just recently planted. And as we'll see in a moment, he was forced to leave the city in a hurry. And obviously, he would, he would have been very concerned about the church and how things are with the church and how they're doing. And he says, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is quite phenomenal when you think about a church that perhaps is less than a year old, as a brand new church, it is an area that Paul has never visited before. He is in Th Thessalonica. Uh, from there he had to leave very quickly and he may be in, in Corinth or somewhere else in Greece at the moment. But he's writing back to a church that he left with very little leadership. These were brand new Christians. And this is what he says about them. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. That's the faith aspect that comes in. It sounds pretty much like um, 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul talks about faith, hope, and love. He says, we remember your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The wonderful commendation that Paul is able to give to this church, writing to them about how well they are doing spiritually. And you know, when I think about my own life, I've been a Christian for many, many years, and, and often I wonder if Paul or someone else would have to write the letter to me, whether they would use words like these for me in terms of my faith and my hope and my love and um, the way that I live for God. And so this is really an encouragement. Uh, in a certain sense, also an, also an indictment when we think about many of us who have been Christians for many years and whether this kind of testimony will be given uh, uh, to us or about us. He says in verse 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy, the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Again, a wonderful testimony that these people have heard the gospel, received it, accepted it, and have actually become an example to other new churches that have been planted in the area of Macedonia uh, or Achaia, or modern-day Greece uh, sort of area. It's a wonderful testimony, I believe, and something that you and I can strive to follow. Um, and and um, pray that the Lord would help us to be such an example to others around us as well. So let's pray together, and then we'll get into the lecture time for this evening. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come to study your Word, and I pray that you would help us as we look into your word tonight as we look at uh, the background and the contents of these letters that we'll be studying, that we'll uh, come to know more about the Bible, more about the background, more about the messages of these letters. But ultimately, Lord, our desire is also to know you better and deeper. Uh, give us a, a deep love for you. And as uh, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Lord, increase our hope, our love, uh, and our faith in you, so that we may be better examples to others, and that we may be testimony of your grace displayed in us and through us every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Oh, welcome once again. Um, we have looked at the New Testament so far. We've now done half uh, of our time together, so we're now entering into the second half. And um, as you, if you have attended the Old Testament module, you will see that we are able to slow down slightly uh, in terms of the number of books that we have to deal with in the New Testament, which is great. It gives us more opportunity to spend time uh, in each one of these uh, letters or books in the New Testament. So far, we have looked at the background to the New Testament, the intertestamental period. We've then uh, looked at the story of Jesus as it's told in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is all part of the revision that we're doing every week so that we know where we've been coming from or where we have come from and where we are going. And then we looked at the early church in the book of Acts. Um, we've looked at um, especially how the church was established in Jerusalem, how it spread to Samaria, Judea and then into the Gentile world, and more specifically through the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we pick up on the Apostle Paul in his life and ministry by going into the letters that Paul wrote, and we're now into the epistles, and we've done the book of Romans, uh, which he wrote towards the end of his third missionary journey. We looked at First and Second Corinthians. There's a, a long-standing relationship uh, between Paul and the church uh, because of several visits and several churches, correspondence back and forth between them. Then we look at Galatians last week, and we looked at the possibility of Paul writing either around after his first missionary journey where he touched southern Galatia, or perhaps writing to all of Galatia, northern Galatia including, and that would then have happened after his second or third missionary journeys. Um, and more specifically, we saw in the book of Galatians the major challenge that uh, Paul faced in, uh, in uh, th those people who came and taught uh, the Gentiles that they must also follow the law of the Old Testament in order to be good Christians. And then Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians we call prison letters. There's one more to come and we'll look at that next week as the little book of Philemon. And we'll look at that one next week. But four letters we believe that Paul wrote from prison and probably while he was in prison in Rome. And so Paul is, is at the end of his life or almost at the end of his life and is reflecting back and is writing to churches, uh, Ephesians and uh, Philippians that he pl planted. The church in Colossae he did not plant, but uh, probably the church was planted while he was uh, spending time in the city of Ephesus at the time. And uh, we were able to look at those three books. Now tonight we're going to continue our study of the letters of Paul. And we're going to look at two letters that he wrote to uh, the church at Thessalonica, the first and second Thessalonians, and then three letters that Paul wrote to individuals. We call them all three the pastoral epistles, and uh, first and second Timothy, and then also the letter that he wrote to Titus. I want to encourage you to read wider, further, deeper, uh, so that you can gain more understanding. More specifically, I want to challenge you to read the Bible, to read these letters, to read them carefully, um, and even slowly uh, to, to take it in. And even for this course, if you just do a, a sort of an overview, a scanning of those letters that we're doing every week, it will help you to, to uh, stay on track in terms of what we are studying and uh, to get a, a good feel for these letters. I make suggestions about the passages that you can read to get a feel for those books, and I want to encourage you to continue reading. When it comes to the order of the letters that Paul wrote, um, it is quite clear that the letters in the Bible in the New Testament have not been ordered in chronological order, and certainly not by way of importance, but it seems like by way of length mostly where Romans is one of the longest letters, and Philemon is going to be the last one we'll study next week, and um, that is the shortest letter uh, that Paul wrote. And um, when, when we look at the letters that we study tonight, Thessalonians, the two letters he wrote to the Thessalonians, may have been the first letters that Paul wrote, that we have a record or a copy of in our Bible. It may even be the older, some of the oldest uh, documents we have in the New Testament. Maybe those letters were written uh, first, as we will see in a moment. But when you then go to the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus, we may be talking about the last of the letters, at least those that have been copied and recorded for us and kept in our New Testament canon. And so from the first in Thessalonians to probably the last in Second Timothy, we are looking at all the other letters that we have already looked at and will look at next week 
uh, all of them fit in between uh, these letters that Paul wrote. And so it's certainly not in chronological order or in order of importance, but rather in terms of length and also the grouping, obviously, when Corinthians, two letters to Corinth, uh, group together two letters to Thessalonians and two uh, to Timothy and so forth. When we look at the letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we need to also read them against the background of Paul's missionary journey to the city of uh, Thessalonica. And here we have Paul, a typical pastor, uh, a person with a pastoral or shepherd heart, writing to a church that he planted and for, to, to people for whom he had a real love and a real concern to make sure that they are staying on track. We've already read a little bit from 1 Thessalonians, um, but it's very clear that Paul had a deep love for these people, and just the way he wrote to them was, was encouragement and not knocking them. Uh, as opposed to Galatians, not that he didn't love the Galatians, in fact, his very love for the Galatian churches prompted him to write about the fact that they have gone astray. They have followed a different gospel. They uh, have believed some of these Judaizers who came and told them that they also need to be circumcised and they need to follow the law in order to be good Christians. But here, uh, when we look at the letters to the Thessalonians, uh, depending on the date that we assign to either Galatians or to James, and we'll be looking at James in a couple of weeks from now, um, and those two books may be early or as early as the Thessalonian letters. Uh, if, if we take the southern Galatia uh, part uh, as, the, as the recipients for the letter to the Galatians, then it would be around 49. These letters that we look at tonight may be around 50 or so that they have been written. And so we are now talking about some of the earliest documents that we have uh, in the New Testament. But as with the other epistles to churches, these uh, letters reflect Paul's concern for the church, his encouragement for them. Um, certainly the fact that he planted them made it such a special relationship uh, between Paul and this church. And that clearly comes out in the letter as you, as you read it. Um, Paul has a heart for this particular church in Thessalonica. The city of Thessalonica, you'll see this against the background of modern-day Thessaloniki. Um, and um, there's still some excavations happening in this particular city, but the modern city of Thessaloniki is built over the tell of Thessalonica, the old city. So it's not, not easy to do excavations. And uh, a little bit more about that in just a moment. But Thessalonica was located at the intersection of two major Roman roads. We've already looked at the Ignatian Way, uh, Via Ignatia. Uh, we looked at that last week. And the other from uh, Danube or the Nube uh, to the Aegean. Thessalonica's location and use as a port made it a prominent city. In 168 BC, it became the capital of the second district of Macedonia. And later it was made capital of and, and a major port of the whole of the Roman province of Macedonia. That was by 146 B.C. In 42 B.C., after the battle at Philippi, Thessalonica was made a free city. And once again, we've now heard that a few times already. But this made it a Roman colony, a free city. And then obviously people born in the city then automatically received Roman citizenship. Due to the city's great commercial importance, says Wikipedia, a spacious harbor was built by the Romans, the famous Burrow Harbor, that accommodated the city's trade up to the 18th century. That's our era, so fairly recently. But it was covered later. Remnants of the harbor's docks can be found nowadays under Frangen Street near the Catholic Church. The city had a sizable Jewish colony established during the 1st century A.D., and it was an early center of Christianity. Now, looking at the excavations, we, uh, I've mentioned that already, but very little has been uncovered at ancient Thessalonica because of what I said earlier on. Uh, Modern-day Thessaloniki sits um, at, on t atop the remains. Um, the area pictured on this slide um, was formerly a bus station, and when it was moved in 1962, the first, this first or second century AD forum was revealed. Excavators found a bathhouse, a mint dating to the first century AD, below pavement surrounding the odium. And then there was an inscription, 
30 BC. It dates from either 30 BC all the way to 143 AD, so around the first century AD um, BC. From the Vardar gate bears the word poly, uh, polytarches, uh, the word that Luke used in reference to the officials of the city before whom Jason was brought by the mob in Acts chapter 17 verse 6. Now, outside of that reference and Acts, we never knew the word. The word was nowhere, didn't occur elsewhere. As obviously, people sort of questioned uh, the book of Acts and Luke using the word for some of the officials of the city. But through excavations, it was then proved that this, this was actually a word that was used during that particular time. And that proves the way that Luke has done his research uh, properly and he was shown to be correct. Now, let me just go back to that picture, and as you will see, uh, modern-day flats in the background, and then over here was a bus station, and then they, when they attempted to move the bus station elsewhere, as they started digging, they found some remains, and then obviously they send in the archaeologists, and they start uncovering, and they uncovered the odium uh, below that, uh, in that particular place. Now, let me also remind you and show you the map once again. When we look at Antioch in Syria, uh, here on the Mediterranean, Tarsus, where Paul was born, uh, and Cilicia, uh, and you follow this line, it, it really gives you the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, uh, going across um, what is modern-day Turkey to Asia Minor on the western side. You'll see the city of Troas um, right there. And then it was here that Paul had a vision, and we looked at that particular story last week. From the vision, he believed that God was calling him and his, his companions to go to Macedonia. They crossed the sea, the agency. They ended up in Neapolis and then went to Philippi uh, up there. Uh, and from there, they ultimately, after the prison uh, uh, experience in Philippi, they went on and uh, Thessalonica is over there, um, right there. And then from Th Thessalonica, he went to Berea. If you follow the line, once again, you'll see he went by ocean, by sea, all the way down to Corinth. He ended up in Athens, actually, where he started preaching the gospel, but then he moved on to Corinth, and he, he settled in Corinth, and he planted the church in Corinth, and that gives us the background to um, the first and second Corinthian type letters that we have seen. And so this is the way you need to sort of understand the background to the planting of the churches, and then also how Paul eventually produced or wrote these letters. Uh, this letter is written to the Th Thessalonians, and uh, Paul was probably sitting in Corinth at the moment when he was writing after he was forced to leave the city. A few people came to know the Lord in uh, Thessalonica after Paul stopped there. In fact, it's uh, worth our while maybe turning to Acts chapter 17 uh, to read something of the background of this particular story, and that will give us an idea of um, this, the church that he planted. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, three weeks, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent, prominent women. In other words, several prominent women also believed. But the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find him, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials. And that's where the word occurs that we have uncovered through archaeology. Um, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. As soon as it was, not, as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Uh, remember the map? They were now going south to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. 
and now the Bereans were more noble, of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message, and so the story goes on. And in verse 13, when the Jews in Thessalonica heard or learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there too, agitate, agitate, agitating the crowd and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. It's in Athens where Paul then preaches the gospel, very little success, and he moves on to Corinth, and that's where he stayed for about 18 months uh, and uh, preached the gospel and planted the church in Corinth. It helps to read the letters against the background of the book of Acts. Uh, as I said before, uh, when you have that historical picture, it really puts it all into a lot more perspective rather than just reading through the letters with names and places and so on that, that don't really make a lot of sense. We can assume that Paul, when he left the city of Thessalonica, left a nucleus of believers behind. How many there were, we are not told, and what kind of leadership they had, we are not told. But the interesting thing is that they seem to be on the go and growing, and certainly uh, through the letter, the, the verses that I read to you earlier on, there is proof of the fact that they have really been well established in their faith, and they are now um, making some progress uh, in the gospel. Brings us to looking at the first letter to the Thessalonians, and we can call it a letter of encouragement, which is what I highlighted uh, when, we read, uh, when we read some of that. Here's another map, and uh, Thessalonica now is an, in bigger fat letter, so you can see better where we are uh, from, um, from this area over here. Uh, Troas cutting across to Philippi, and then over to Thessalonica on, on that side. The letter was written around 50 AD, as I said, making it one of the earliest letters or books literally in the New Testament, even before the Gospels were written. When Paul left Thessalonica, he went to Berea, then in a hurry, uh, he left to go to Athens, and uh, from there to Corinth, and we read the story of his uh, church planting endeavors in the city of Corinth in Acts chapter 17, verses 10, all the way to chapter 18, verse 4. While Paul was in Corinth, Silas and Timothy caught up with him. In fact, those who left, uh, we, read, we read that those who left Paul in Athens had instructions to go back and tell Timothy and, and Silas to come. Uh, they were left in Berea at the time. So obviously continuing with the church planting and teaching and establishing the church, etc., etc. And so now Silas and Timothy joined Paul and they brought him some very good news. The news is the church is growing. The church is happy. The church has some questions, uh, more specifically around the second coming, because you started talking to them about that, but they want to know more. And in the meantime, some of the believers, those who have trusted the Lord, have died. And so they have questions about, okay, so what happens to them? You told us Jesus is coming back, but now some Christians are dying in the meantime. So what's the story? How, how are things happening? So obviously, in the short time that Paul was there, he was not able to cover the whole spectrum of theology uh, with them. He taught them a whole lot, but he, did, he, he wasn't able to teach them everything. And so the letter is a result of some questions that the church had, as well as the fact that Paul was excited about the um, wonderful things that he's hearing from his fellow workers. Generally speaking, when we look at the contents of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, it's encouraging. It does not appear to address any problems. Um, it um, simply uh, encourages the church, answers some questions about uh, issues that they had, such as the second coming and, and related uh, uh, concepts. Uh, but up to this point in time, there has not been enough time for those who later would follow in the footsteps of Paul, those Judaizers who would come and teach them that they also need to be circumcised and so on. So that, that issue does not surface in the letters to the Thessalonians. There ha simply hasn't been enough time for that sort of false teaching uh, to reach them yet. Um, it, this is more Paul's concern for, um, for the church in terms of whether they are holding on to the faith, uh, whether the short time that he spent with them was enough to establish them in their faith. And so from this letter, it seems that the church had questions related to the second coming and more specifically uh, 
the untimely, you can call it untimely death of some of the Christians before Jesus came back and they wondered what's happening with those people. Paul is in answering them by giving some guidelines and directives, but he focuses mainly on encouraging them to continue to live for Christ uh, and not to worry too much about those who die in the Lord. Here uh, on this slide, again, you will see the modern-day city Thessaloniki in the background and some more unearthing of ancient uh, ruins here in the, in the front. And this is an, an ancient Greek agora. An agora is a marketplace uh, which was later expanded to become a Roman forum. Um, and again, this is just uh, you know, somewhere a building collapses or they want to build a new building. And as they start digging foundations, they come upon uh, certain remains and then they stop the whole process and archaeologists go in and they start uncovering. And that becomes a museum or a, a tourist attraction and so on. Let me look at the letter to the Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians, by way of contents, there's the opening remark, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verses 2 to 10, the thanksgiving for the church, where Paul, I started reading that, uh, where he gives thanks to God for the way the church is actually progressing. And then in chapter 2, um, he defends his ministry. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi, as you know. Now, when you read that, it now makes a lot more sense because now you understand from a map and also the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, he's gone from Troas in Philippi. That's where he was thrown into jail. The jailer came to know the Lord and he was then escorted out of the city. From there he went to Thessalonica. And so Paul is now referring to this historical little bit of information. And he says, as you know, um, that we suffered in Philippi, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you His gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. And he's really defending his ministry as well as the gospel. He says, what we have taught you, what we have told you is the truth. We're not making money out of this. This is not trying to build a, uh, some kind of a... a a, a new movement based on ourselves. This is all about Jesus Christ. And so he defends his ministry uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. Coming to verse 17. But brothers, when we were torn away, he tells them how uh, he, was, he had to move on, and, he, and he's now writing to them. Um, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I Paul did again and again, but Satan stopped us. An interesting perspective of the Apostle Paul here. Satan stopped us. Uh, he wanted to go, uh, but in this particular case, he interpreted that as the devil didn't want him to go, so he stopped him. On a previous occasion, when they were in Troas, they wanted to go in different directions, and they couldn't get there, and they interpreted that, if you go back to the book of, Luke, of, of Acts, rather, you'll find that they believed the Holy Spirit stopped them from going, going there. Uh, but when they, go, when, when, when they went to Philippi, to Macedonia, it was the Holy Spirit who led them there. So it's interesting how you interpret, and, and of course this is interesting preaching material, study material, when you start looking at when is it the devil that stops me, and when is the Holy Spirit that stops me uh, from doing something. Anyway, that's, a, that's another story for another day. But Paul simply in these verses, uh, 2, 2 verse 17 to 3 verse 13, expresses his concern for the church. Timothy has come back. He reports that uh, or he talks about that in, in verses uh, 6 and further of chapter 3. Chapter 4, how Christians should live, living to please God. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. So it's not as if Paul is um, reprimanding them. He's actually encouraging them. You are doing but I just want you to do more of that. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be holy, that you should live a holy life. So how Christians should live. And then in chapter 4 verse 13, Paul comes to the major theme of the book. Apart from the encouragement that he wants to give them and the building up, he then talks about this major issue which uh, arises out of questions. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. It's a euphemism for 
those who died, uh, those who fall asleep or fell asleep, uh, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul is not saying that they should not grieve. He's simply saying you don't grieve without hope. You grieve with hope. Um, and then he says we believe that Jesus died, rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. So in one little sentence, and he now expands on that, and we don't have time to go into the rest, but in one little sentence he says, you don't have to worry about those Christians who have died, because he, they are with Jesus, and when Jesus comes back at his second coming, these believers, those believers, will come back with him. And so they're with him now, with Jesus, and they will come with him. Um, and so you don't have to be concerned about where they are and what's going, what, what has happened to them, what will happen to, to them. And so all the way down to chapter 5, verse 11, he gives us some information. Unfortunately for us, not enough. But he gives us some information about the second coming and some of the conditions around uh, the second coming. And then in chapter 5, verse 12, final instructions, more guidelines for practical living. Uh, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you. So obviously Paul, uh, as was his custom, appointed some leaders to help run the church, as it were. And so he's now asking the congregation to respect those people, hold them in highest regard, live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers, uh, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak. So some practical advice and then um, at the end he comes with a conclusion, which is basically greeting uh, the brothers with a holy kiss uh, and so forth. So that's uh, the book in terms of outline and contents uh, of First Thessalonians. In this book, as we have seen already, we find encouragement uh, by way of a summary of the message. New believers must persevere in their faith despite persecution. Paul um, certainly knew about the persecutions and the sufferings that they are enduring. Um, Paul wrote to them about the reality of suffering and the opposition that we will face. Um, as I said, just his own reference to the fact that the devil prevented him from coming back uh, to them uh, is one of the things that you will have to live by. Uh, that's reality in this world. But Paul encourages them because of their strong faith. Uh, he left the church in a hurry, but they are steadfast, and he's, he's very encouraged by that. He talks much about Christian behavior. And then, as I said, one of the major themes is that of the second coming. And then, interestingly enough, in this book, the name of God, the, name, the word God, theos in Greek, uh, occurs 36 times in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And um, Paul certainly wanted to link these people to God and not to himself. And I find that extremely encouraging in the life of, and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It was never about himself. It was never building the ministry of, of Paul or having a, a, a building named after him or uh, the Paul ministry or something. It was always about God. It was always linking people to God. I, I find that um, in 1 Corinthians as well, when Paul writes to a church where that is one of the problems, that, that you have these followers, people say, I am of Paul, and I am of Cephas or Peter, I am of, of uh, Apollos. Um, Paul is saying, you're not following me. Uh, he, in fact, he's, he goes so far as to say, I didn't even baptize you. You weren't baptized in Paul's name. I didn't even baptize many of you. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about Paul. It's not the name Paul that is important. It is Jesus that is important. And I want to encourage you, it's two weeks old now, but to go back to the notes and to the book of 1 Corinthians and read those first two, three chapters again, where Paul lays a foundation for his ministry. And that foundation is one single thing, in fact, person, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's not about the Apostle Paul. It, uh, it does... Uh, say something about the kind of ministries that we see around the world, some of them springing up in the name of many different kinds of people. I'm not overly critical as far as that is concerned, but sometimes I wonder whether, whether one shouldn't uh, maybe, uh, uh, whether one should perhaps avoid linking your own name to a ministry or a building or, or some kind of a thing so that people are rather connected to God rather than a single uh, individual or a, a human individual. As you read through 1 Thessalonians, uh, the strong faith that I mentioned before we started reading that, chapter 4, the practical living side of things, and then 
um, that section about the second coming. Uh, when we come to the last module and the very last lecture, we will be looking at the second coming. And there's certain pockets of scripture uh, that are directly uh, linked to the second coming and the conditions of the second coming of Jesus. Now, of course, the teaching, uh, the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus uh, is, is all over the scriptures. And we don't want to base any of our beliefs on one single or just a few little pockets of scripture or verses or extracts from the Bible. We want to base it on on everything, which is why that last module is called The Big Picture. We look at all of Scripture to find out what the Bible says about many different kinds of things. But, but having said that, it is true that there are certain passages in the Bible that speak more about certain things, such as uh, the Second Coming. And First and Second Thessalonians give us some great uh, directives when it comes to the Second Coming of Jesus and some of the conditions around that. Talking about 2 Thessalonians uh, and talking about the second coming, the two are directly linked. When Paul wrote uh, in 1 Thessalonians about those who died in Christ, that was a question that people had. Paul, Silas and, and uh, Timothy reported to Paul that the church at Thessalonica had questions about those believers who have died in Christ. What's going to happen to them? And they are now gone. And and, and let's say we're alive when Christ comes back. What will happen to us? What will happen to those who are dead? Now, 2,000 years later, we, we're not too concerned about that anymore because in 2,000 years, millions of people have died. And so we don't, we don't ask that type of question. But it was a very relevant question in their day and time. So, uh, uh, one of the reasons was that they believed that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. And, and what if He comes back in our lifetime? And what then will happen to those who have died. So Paul addressed that whole issue in chapter 4 and 5 of First Thessalonians. That actually raised more questions than uh, Paul was able to answer in First Thessalonians. And so Second Thessalonians is ultimately a result of the questions that Paul raised around the second coming. He was then almost forced, if you wish, uh, to go and write Second Thessalonians to address some of the concerns he raised, some of the gaps that he left by raising some issues but not giving full and complete answer to all of that. So a few months after writing First Thessalonians, Paul followed it up with this letter, Second Thessalonians. He received feedback from the church, either verbally or in writing. We don't have a record of the letter. If they wrote him, we don't have a, a record of that. But, but obviously Paul sent... 1 Thessalonians with someone, and it reached the city of Thessalonica and the church. They read it. Now they had more concerns. And so a few months go by, and so either the person who brought the letter to them has now gone back to the Apostle Paul and said, you have now raised more issues, and so the church has now major concerns about this second coming thing that you have talked about. And so Paul then actually needed to write to them. He also became aware of some related issues, such as some people who said, well, Paul taught us that Jesus is going to come back, and therefore I'm going to resign my job and sit out there and wait for Jesus to come, uh, which is uh, not the best of ideas. Um, not too long ago we had some kind of a prophecy about a date that Jesus is going to come back again, and lo and behold, some people right here in South Africa uh, sold everything, moved into a hotel, and waited for Jesus to come back. And the day came and the day left, uh, and Jesus didn't come back, not, at least not the way they, they expected. And so it's not a new thing, um, and it's not the last time it's going to happen. And so Paul found that also in that particular uh, situation. Second Thessalonians was Paul's response to an ongoing relationship. Just as we saw with uh, First and Second Corinthians, Paul was in constant contact with the churches that he planted. And um, we have in both uh, the city of Corinth, or the situation of, of Corinth, the church in Corinth, as well as here in Thessalonica, we have double letters written uh, as a sign of Paul's ongoing concern uh, for these churches. When we look at Second Thessalonians, the main issue here is that of the anticipated return of Jesus Christ. In his first letter, Paul raised those questions. He now needed to put them in, in better perspective. Uh, it then also provides us information about the eternal destiny uh, 
of those who did not know Christ and how Christians need to prepare for Jesus' return. So when we go to, to 2 Thessalonians, this is how he starts. Again, the same people. He says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And you go back to 1 Thessalonians and you'll find the exact same thing. Um, those are the people writing. So the conditions are very similar. The time is probably just a few months on. The church To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. Paul has now heard even more reports of the fact that they are growing. And, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Seems like the situation in Thessalonica hasn't changed much. The people, the Christians, are still being persecuted. They still are suffering, just as they did when Paul was there, when he wrote 1 Thessalonians. That situation is still ongoing. When we look at an outline as you then go through the rest of the book, uh, there is the thanksgiving, which I started reading in, in chapter 1, um, and the prayer for the perseverance. And Paul says in verse 5, All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. So the suffering is still there. And then in verse 11, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of His calling, and that by His power He may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. So Paul is continuing to pray for them as he's praying for all the churches that they will grow, uh, that they will be mature, and that they will be strong in their faith. And then in chapter 2, this is the way he starts. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us. Now, having said that, it seems like other people were also writing letters to churches. Now, we don't have records of those, but it seems like they may have heard from someone, and someone may even have used the name of Paul in writing to the church. Now, that may be part of the background to Paul's comment over here. Whether that is or not, we, we can't affirm any longer. But he says, Don't be too concerned about all those saying that the day of the Lord has already come. It's interesting when we, go, when we uh, looked at the Old Testament prophecies uh, or prophets, the concept of the day of the Lord was one that we looked at again and again. And back in that module, um, I, I said to you that what we have uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the prophets in the Old Testament is, is, is reference to the day of the Lord, which has multiple fulfillments. And for Joel, for example, the day of the Lord came with the disaster, probably the locust plague that hit the, the nation. And the day of the Lord was therefore a day of judgment for the nation. But there was also the day of the Lord that was still anticipated. The day of the Lord came when Jesus came to this world. And when Jesus died, it was the day of the Lord. But then there is another day of the Lord. And in the New Testament terms or terminology, the day of the Lord refers to the second coming of Jesus. And we now still live with that anticipated day of the Lord. Day of the Lord meaning the time or the occasion when Jesus is going to come back. So, word has reached the Thessalonians, and they're now very concerned, because Paul told them that Jesus is coming back. Now some people either prophesied, or came and told them, or they have received a letter from someone saying, the day of the Lord already occurred. Jesus' second coming already occurred. Now, of course, that would be very, very confusing. I mean, here we are, living in this world, uh, you know, have we been left behind? What's the story? What's going on here? And Paul says, I don't want you to be uh, concerned about that. And so he then continues to explain that. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Now, we need to interpret that. that, that is, uh, that's one of the major contentious issues in, in Christian belief. And it has to do with, and Paul doesn't use the word antichrist over here. In fact, the word, as we will see in a couple of weeks' time, the word antichrist 
uh, only occurs in the letter of John, 1 John. It doesn't occur anywhere else. But there is belief among scholars that when Paul talks about the man of destruction, or the man of not destruction, the man of lawlessness, that we may be talking about the same character, the Antichrist. And so Paul gives some, some idea of the conditions before the second coming, and he's really in, in essence saying that there will be some clear indication of the coming of Jesus Christ. And therefore, um, in Paul's interpretation, it hasn't taken place yet because the conditions haven't, uh, haven't been um, occurring. And therefore, the second coming hasn't taken place. Now, as, as I said, it is one of the major contentious issues as to exactly what Paul meant by that, how that's going to pan out, and then you start studying Old Testament books like Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation and other passages, and then people come to different conclusions as to exactly how Jesus will come back, when he comes back, the conditions and the, the sequence of events, etc., etc. We'll be looking at that in more detail, um, both in the book of Revelation in the last uh, lecture uh, of this module as well as in the last lecture of the, of the next module. We'll be trying to put those pictures together and look at least at some of the uh, the different teachings in this regard. It's not our purpose tonight to, to do all of that. But Paul does say um, that he told them these things. He says in verse 5, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back. Now, Paul says, you know what's holding him back. We don't. Uh, I, I so wish Paul just said it, you know, bluntly, but he doesn't. And so, of course, now it gives rise to all sorts of speculation once again uh, among different views and different scholars and different Christians as to exactly what Paul means when he says that. And so, yeah, talking about the second coming, it's not exactly that clear uh, what Paul, has meant, what Paul is, has meant when he wrote uh, these things. Anyway, he goes on after talking about that to encourage them once again in verse 13 and further of chapter 2 uh, to stand firm. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord. Again, Paul is so encouraging. He's so positive. I uh, want to encourage you. Uh, he's not here to discourage them or to uh, uh, reprimand them or to judge them. He's here to really encourage them. And then he requests prayer for himself. Uh, there's warning against the idleness. In the name of the Lord Jesus, in verse 6 of chapter 3, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you. And then he says in verse 11, We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. You, you can't have it more direct than that. That is basically work. That's how God created us, to work, to earn an income, and then to be ready for the second coming. Not by resigning and sitting and waiting for the second coming, but rather to, to be busy with what God created us to do, and that is to work and to earn our income. And then uh, conclusion, verse 17, um, is one of those uh, sort of signatories at the end of a letter. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters, this is how I write. I, I think Paul does this, and you need to read it again against the background of his other reference, even if you receive a letter supposedly written by us. In other words, here you will find my signature, and my signature is what makes this letter authentic. And so look out for my signature, as it were, uh, is what Paul is saying to them at the end of that letter. And then just to read in Second Thessalonians, there is a faith to boast about in chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. The lawless one, um, as I said, not altogether clear. And then the fact that Christians actually do work. And then we're going to look at the pastoral epistles, but we'll take a tea break before we get there.
Okay, we're going to look at the uh, pastoral epistles. The word pastoral, uh, interesting, I did a, a Google search a while ago and I typed in pastoral and I came across a website of Australian farmers of sheep. Um, and so um, we, when, you, when you just look at the word pastoral, it has a connotation with shepherd or shepherding or pasturing a flock. Uh, the, the term pastoral in this particular case refers to the fact that Paul wrote these letters out of his concern for two of his followers or co-workers. Proteges is, is another word, Timothy and Titus. Both of them were former companions of Paul. They traveled with him and then Paul left him in certain places uh, where they were supposed to continue uh, to pastor or to oversee some of the work that, that Paul uh, has been doing with them. Now, as I said earlier, these letters, uh, First, Second Timothy, as well as Titus, probably represent the last of the letters that Paul wrote. Um, there are some critical issues here that we have to look at, and some scholars don't believe that Paul wrote these letters because they don't fit into the life and the chronology and the details that we find in the letters of Paul in the book of Acts. And so we have to then go with church tradition, which we can't prove, it's simply there in, uh, in early church tradition that Paul was released from prison at some stage and um, that he then traveled a bit more. And then um, in, uh, on those journeys that he then wrote these letters that we call the pastoral uh, epistles. Most scholars now, uh, more conservative scholars I would say, I should say, uh, follow the early church tradition that Paul was released after Acts chapter 28, after those two years where um, Luke ends his book and maybe that's the last of, of what Luke actually ever wrote uh, and that he, that he was not concerned about the rest of the story. Either that or, or Luke just didn't have another opportunity to write anymore. But in the church tradition, there is a, a belief that Paul was released from the t after the two years in prison in Rome, that he traveled a bit more, and that we now need to fit these pastoral letters, these three that we're looking at, that we need to fit them in uh, under what would then become known as a fourth missionary journey, not recorded in the Bible uh, for us. Now, of course, there are more critical scholars who would not believe that. They would say, nope, Paul didn't write this uh, because they didn't fit into the picture, and they would regard them as pseudepigraphic, in other words, a, a different person, maybe in the second century or late first century, wrote these books in the name of Paul and that ultimately the church adopted them. I would hold the more conservative view, and that is that Paul was actually released and that he did uh, write these letters. Um, there is a, uh, the off chance that Paul may have written these letters before, in other words, during the events that are described in the book of Acts. However, when you look at the, his travels, the names, the cities, the places that he mentions in the pastoral epistles, they don't fit any of the details that we have in the book of Acts. And so my personal belief, I would lean very strongly to, um, to the view that says Paul was released. He, he had a fourth missionary journey, if you want to call it that, and that it was during that particular journey that he wrote the letters to Timothy and uh, Titus. I'll come back to the fourth missionary journey uh, in, in just a moment, but this is uh, one of the books that I'm, I'm using, uh, Encountering the New Testament by Elwell and Yarborough. Um, I'll quote from them, and they say, Following an ancient tradition that Paul was released from prison at Rome in about A.D. 62, uh, their date is about two years or so earlier than the, the date that I have given you before, uh, again, I need to warn you that if you read other books, you will find that give and take one, one year, two years, five years sometimes, uh, that scholars don't always agree on the exact time. I mean, the dates have not been recorded exactly for us. So it uh, depends on how you interpret the, uh, the details available to us. But some scholars suggest that Paul then embarked on a fourth missionary journey or tour. If so, he may have journeyed to Spain, and uh, he mentions Spain and the, and the desire to go there in Romans 15, in verse 24 and 28. Also, uh, 1 Clemens chapter 5, verse 7, which is an extra-biblical book that is a reference to a journey that Paul had to Spain. And then he headed back uh, east towards the island of Crete. That will become very important to us because we'll look at, at Titus in a moment. 
visiting former haunts like Ephesus and Macedonia. He mentions that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Other travels could have taken him to Miletus and Corinth. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20, he mentions that. Those details don't fit in with Acts. And then Troas in 2 Timothy 4 uh, verse 13. And then also Nicopolis or Nicopolis, whichever pronunciation you prefer. And he mentions that in, in Titus chapter 3, verse 12, where he seems to be when he's writing the letter to Titus, whom he left on the island of Crete. Again, those details don't fit the story that we have in the book of Acts. Um, and so you need to bear all of these details in mind. Now, if you then look at the journey, for example, on this map, you will see Paul released from prison in Italy, in Rome, uh, over there, and that he probably then directly went to Spain. That would not have been too much of a burden for him. In terms of distance and so on, it's not an issue. Uh, he could have gone by sea, even by land, but ended up in Spain. Uh, we have no actual record of that, apart from the early church tradition, that he turned around and went all the way back to Asia Minor, uh, where he traveled around a little bit in Ephesus, after crossing over the island of Crete, and island, the island of Crete is down here, and then from there he went up, and there is Philippi, and near Philippi is the city of Nicopolis, where one of the things he mentions in his letter, and that eventually ended up back uh, in prison in Rome, and it's somewhere between 64 and 66. By about 66 or so, Paul was executed by Nero uh, in Rome. So that's how the story goes. Um, as I said, this we cannot actually verify, certainly not from the information we have in the Bible. Um, but, but this makes the most sense in terms of background when you look at First and Second Timothy and Titus. When Paul is writing to, to Timothy, the first letter, it is really primarily about false teachings. And uh, it, it's very clear, even as you start reading the book, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior and, and, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Uh, to Timothy and grace and peace to you. And then in verse 3, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. Um, a couple of comments here. The one is, I, when I, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus. Now, that comment makes no sense against the background of the book of Acts at all. Uh, we have just looked at Thessalonians, and we have seen Timothy with Paul in that same region, and traveling back and forth in Macedonia. So when Paul was on his second mission journey planting those churches, there was no uh, issue like this. I left you in Ephesus to, to look after the church there while I'm in Macedonia. So obviously Paul is talking about a subsequent visit. Now, it could be a third missionary journey, it could be a fourth missionary journey, as we have just seen. And so it's little comments like that, that scholars are trying to fit and piece together in terms of the historical background. The second thing I want to mention is, as Paul jumps into the content, the body of the letter, immediately he, he puts in, in sharp focus what he's going to talk about. He says, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines. And, and as you read through the letter, that theme comes through again and again and again. So if we then put the whole picture together for the city of Ephesus, Paul visits the city, plants the church in the book of Acts. He writes them a letter when he is in his first imprisonment. And then he writes this letter to Timothy, also essentially to Timothy, but, but in the city of Ephesus. And then fast forward the story to the book of Revelation. And we're then talking about roughly 40 years on. And you have Jesus writing a letter via John to the church at Ephesus. By which time, 30, 40 years later, uh, things have really, the wheels have come off in terms of their real devotion to Christ. And their heart is no longer in the right place. Have they given in in the meantime to false teachings? Uh, well, it seems like, like it did. Um, and then if you then fast forward the story even more, uh, many hundreds of years later, uh, well, actually 2,000 years later, there is no church. In fact, the, the whole country of Turkey is 90, 98% um, Islam or Muslim. Um, 
uh, there is no Christian witness. It's a very, very sad story uh, because for centuries, Turkey or Asia, was, Asia Minor, was the major, major focus of Christianity. Uh, that's where some of the most important church meetings took place for the first hundreds of years of Christianity. And then, obviously, has now been taken over by Muslims. Uh, and it's, a, as I said, a, a, a sad state of affairs for the Christian church. Going back to Timothy, the man Timothy uh, was discovered, if you wish, um, I use that word, uh, on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 16. And it's worthwhile maybe just turning to the book of Acts and just looking at that particular story uh, very briefly. Paul is on his, on his missionary journey. Um, actually, it's, it's Paul's second uh, missionary journey. Um, not his first, his second missionary journey. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on his journey, on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So as Paul sets out, this is the early part of his, of his second missionary journey, not the first one, as the notes say. Timothy was the son of a mixed marriage. Uh, his mother was Jewish, and his father was a Greek. And for some reason, his mother... Uh, therefore didn't take him to be circumcised. And when Paul discovered him, um, he uh, took him in and had him circumcised, or he circumcised him himself. And Timothy became quite prominent in the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Several times he's mentioned as a co-worker, I'm sending Timothy, or Timothy and I write to you, or Timothy will come and he will bring me news. And so the list goes on. And here we have now two letters written to this man, uh, Timothy. Timothy was raised in a godly environment. Uh, go back to the letter to uh, Timothy, and you will find Paul actually say in 2 uh, Timothy, in chapter 1, verse 5, um, he says, um, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. So, uh, Timothy is a third generation. Now we need to be careful. Was he a third generation Christian? In other words, did his grandmother believe in Jesus, and then his mother, and then Timothy? Now, part of me is saying there hasn't been enough time for his grandmother to become a Christian, and then his mother, and then a third generation is now Timothy to be a Christian. So perhaps his grandmother was a strong Jewish believer, and so was his mother. And somewhere in the process, either the grandmother or the mother became Christian. And then they helped Timothy to become Christian as well. And so uh, where exactly that happened, we are not told. Uh, but it seems like in that whole region around the cities of Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, that Timothy was, was well known in the district. And um, he was now known as a Christian as well, and Paul then uh, took him in. In terms of the destiny, to whom or to which city the letter was addressed or written, obviously we know the letter is addressed to Timothy, Paul's long-standing companion. According to the letter, Paul left Timothy in the city of Ephesus uh, as the pastor or the leader of the church there. The geographical destination is therefore Ephesus, and we've talked enough about that city, so I'm not going to go there again. And Paul is now more focusing on the, on the pastoral side. He's writing to a pastor of a church. And in terms of the message, Paul is giving guidance to a Timothy. Probably Timothy is no longer uh, young anymore. His name Timothy means something like timid. And Paul plays around sometimes with the words of names. We'll pick that up again next week when we look at the letter to Philemon as well. Um, but uh, he, he refers to Timothy as a young man. Now, Timothy may have been 35 or 40, so you're not exactly talking about a teenager, although he could have been younger than that. Certainly he was younger than the Apostle Paul was, 
but he was no longer just a spring chicken uh, anymore. And uh, especially if we're talking about a late stage in the life of the Apostle Paul, then Timothy couldn't have been um, a very, very young uh, anymore. He addressed the following uh, areas or issues in the letter. Dealing with false doctrines, as I said, is, one of, is, is actu actually the main theme. The, then he talks about the role of leaders. It's um, in the book of Timothy, books of Timothy, 1 Timothy and Titus, that we find directives about elders and deacons that you don't find anywhere else. The only thing mentioned in the book of Acts is that Paul appointed elders as he went along. He left those people. Also in the book of Acts, we have the appointment of the seven in Acts chapter 6. But we don't have a description of their role and what they were supposed to do. But here we have guidelines and directives given by Paul to Timothy and Titus in terms of the kind of leadership that they need to appoint. And those two roles uh, become very prominent. The role of elder, overseer, or bishop, those are synonyms of each other. Uh, and then the role of deacons. And Paul has a long list of um, do's and don'ts and qualifications and characteristics that are required for these. And then there are also regulations for worship. Uh, some of the things that happen in, in worship, when, when you gather as a church, and then the care for the needy. In First Timothy, there's a long section that Paul writes about widows, uh, which has been a major emphasis of the church from the early days in Jerusalem, to care for the poor and to look after the poor. It's interesting that even uh, extra-biblical literature um, ref refers to the fact that Christians were the ones who looked after the poor, um, to the point where they said um, they looked after the poor of other people, not, not just their own family. They even looked after the poor in the community. And so they were commended for the way that they have um, been involved in social ministry or soci social outreach. When you look at an outline and the contents of First Timothy, after the introductions, there is the introduction to the false teachings and how Timothy need to stand up against them, how Paul believed and, and we should believe that we are saved by grace. Uh, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul, here right at the end of his life just about, and the only thing he could do is still look back and, and thank God for his grace. Paul never came to the point where he believed he did it all on his own, or that he deserved to be saved. It always was by the grace of God. And it's something that you and I need to hold on to, is that we are saved by the grace of God and not our own doings. And then worship guidelines we find uh, in chapter 2, it's an interesting section. It also contains the reference to uh, women. Um, uh, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Now, this has given rise to massive debates, massive debates in the Christian church over the years, and more specifically in our day and time, um, and it, it, it has to do with the authority of women or women in ministry uh, and so on and so on. And, and most people then end up in this, in this section. Uh, and then, of course, the debates go uh, uh, all over the place in terms of how you interpret this against the rest of Scripture, etc., uh, etc. Et and then the leaders, the elders and deacons in chapter 3. Um, and then Paul has instructions to Timothy how a pastor or a leader in the church should conduct himself. Chapters 5 and 6 have a general advice, advice, advice about widows, elders, slaves, uh, some of those realities. We'll talk more about slaves and slavery next week when we look at the book of Philemon. And the love of money. Um, again, uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he wrote to um, the city of Ephesus or the church in Ephesus. And um, it is no secret that the city was a wealthy one. Lots of trade running through the city. People, wealthy people live there. Some of those people have become Christians. And now they're dealing with this issue of being Christian and being rich. And uh, Paul gives some directives in chapter 6 about how to deal with money. When you're a, when you're a, a rich person, when you're a wealthy person, and you're a Christian. Paul never says that you cannot be wealthy. Uh, 
But Paul says you must be careful where you place your trust. Your trust is not in your money, in your material possessions. Your trust is in God. And, and therefore, um, and he goes on to say in verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Wonderful directive here that we have. Um, and any one of us really here uh, should regard ourselves not as super rich, but certainly wealthy in terms of what we have. Uh, we, we dress, we eat, we have cars, we, uh, we live wealthy lives compared to 80% of this world. Uh, we, we're in the top 20% bracket uh, in this world, really. Uh, some of the important passages, uh, the basis of Paul's calling, uh, we've read that in chapter 1, verses 12 to 17, instructions for worship, I've made a comment about that. Um, there are instructions for worship, and that's where the women in ministry sort of issue arises. Qualifications for elders, Timothy in ministry, and the life and struggle of a good Christian in chapter 6. Second Timothy, I would call a pastoral farewell. We're really coming to the end of Paul's life. And when you read through this letter, it's very clear that Paul is anticipating uh, the end of his own life. Uh, in fact, this is the way he says that in chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And so Paul is, is certainly expecting his own death, his imminent uh, death. Um, lovely picture he's using here from an Old Testament uh, image, and that is the pouring out of an, a sacrifice. It's not, not the kind of thing that, we, that we're too familiar with, but there, there have been times when they would fill a cup and they would literally empty the cup as a sign of emptying your life, of giving everything. So instead of drinking it, uh, there, there's this little picture of David at one stage. He was thirsty for some of the water, I think, that came from Bethlehem or wherever. They were surrounded by the enemies, and um, a couple of his, his uh, leaders heard him, and they broke through the line and went and got some water, and they brought it back to David. And when David found the, got the water, he said, I can't drink this, and he poured it out as a sign of his sacrificial giving. And so when Paul says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, it is sacrificial giving. I've given my life. The last drop is about to fall. And that's the picture, that's the image here uh, that, that uh, Paul is using. The second letter to Timothy is most likely, uh, was most likely written after Titus. So the order is 1 Timothy, Titus, and then 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy then would represent the last of the letters of, of the Apostle Paul, probably written about 66, 67, just before his death, um, give and take a couple of years. He wrote it from prison. And um, if we are correct in the fourth missionary journey or trip, then we're talking about Paul in prison just before he was executed, uh, as I said, about 66, 67. The letters create probably, in terms of all of Paul's letters, the most critical uh, assessments by scholars. And that is, surely Paul could not have written this letter sort of approach or attitude or, or arguments. Um, and the reasons for that is because of the lateness, because of the information here, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, I don't want to go into all of those arguments, but I, do, I can tell you that Irenaeus, Irenaeus in 175 AD already knew about it. He attributed the book to Paul. Uh, as well as Clement of Alexandria uh, by the end of the second century also uh, uh, attributed this book to, to the Apostle Paul. In terms of the message of Second Timothy, it sheds much light on the last moments of Paul's life. Uh, he wrote to encourage Timothy in ministry once again to request him to visit him. Um, and again, the false teachings you find written about. Uh, there are many temptations in chapter 3. And, and how there will be godlessness in the last days, as Paul calls it here. He charges Timothy to be uh, faithful to his own ministry and preaching, and then the danger of watering down the gospel uh, that must be avoided. It is in this book that we find that wonderful reference um, to uh, 
the scriptures, the inspired scriptures in chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then verse 16, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's one of the passages I suggest that you read. Um, but as you go through um, the book, you'll find the role of spiritual parents and mentoring. Uh, Paul is a mentor to Timothy, and, and Paul is encouraging Timothy to be a mentor to others. One of my favorite verses, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, and he says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men, who will also be qualified to teach others. You're talking about four generations of people. Paul teaching Timothy to teach others who will be able to teach others once again or in turn. And then uh, uh, we've looked at that final little word from the Apostle Paul uh, about his own life. Then we come to the letter to Titus. As we start the letter, uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and his appointed season. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Then in verse 5, the body of the letter, and he jumps right in, he says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out was what, what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I direct you or directed you. So here we have a guidelines given to another pastor, but this time someone who seems to have oversight over several churches on the island of Crete. Now Titus, and here is a, a quote from Easton's Bible Dictionary, Titus was with Paul and Barnabas at Antioch, he accompanied them to the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, although his name nowhere occurs in the Acts of the Apostles. He appears to have been a Gentile and to have been chiefly engaged in ministering to Gentiles. For Paul sternly refused to have him circumcised, inasmuch as in his case the cause of gospel liberty was at stake. We find him at a later period with Paul and Timothy at Ephesus, whence he was sent by Paul to Corinth for the purpose of of getting the contributions of the church there on behalf or in behalf of the poor saints at Jerusalem, uh, 2 Corinthians 8. He rejoined the apostle when he was in Macedonia and cheered him with the tidings he brought from Corinth. When we talk about uh, Titus, we need to understand the background of the island of Crete. Uh, Titus on the island of Crete, after Paul's reference to Titus in 2 Corinthians, his name is not mentioned till after Paul's first imprisonment, when we find him engaged in the organization of the church at Crete, where the apostle had left him for this purpose, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. The last notice of him is in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, where we find him with Paul at Rome. So the movements, and this is part of the problem with the pastoral epistles, the movements of Paul and some of his co-workers, all of those things are not 100% clear. Uh, here we have Titus in Crete. In 2 Timothy we have Titus in Rome. Um, it, it's not impossible, of course, because we're talking months um, um, difference and uh, people could have traveled during that time, uh, which is not really a problem. The writing of the letter to Titus, and by the way, there is an odium that was uncovered in Nicopolis, um, the city that I mentioned, and it's from this city, apparently, that Paul wrote the letter to Titus. This is the shortest of the pastoral epistles. It's addressed to Titus, who was left on the island of Crete to oversee the work there. Um, this may have included a number of churches, as we have just seen. Um, I, I've read the, the verse where Paul says, I left you there so you may appoint elders from city to city. So it's not just one single church, but it seems like it was almost like a, uh, an, an overseer or a bishop of several churches uh, on the island of Crete. Paul seemed to have been in Nicopolis or Nicopolis or heading towards the city. It's about 225 kilometers northwest of Corinth when he wrote this letter. It was close to the city of Philippi. And he included some instructions on how to handle false teachers. Again, 
at this late stage in the life of the Apostle Paul, uh, we already in his early ministry, he encountered false teachings. Uh, those things simply increased. And um, by the second and third century and by today, we have hundreds and thousands of different beliefs and belief systems and false teachings and things that we need to be so careful about. And, and that started all the way back in the first century. On this map, you'll find the island of Crete down, right down at the bottom. Um, you can see Asia Minor over here um, on this side. And uh, there is Corinth and Greece on that side. So the island of Crete is not a small little island. Uh, it is also the island where, you go back to the Old Testament, you remember the, the story of the Philistines. And uh, many scholars believe the, the sea peoples they were called, or the Philistines eventually, that they originated from the island of Crete. Now that goes all the way back into the Old Testament, a couple of uh, millennia before Christ. Crete, uh, which is now called Candia, is one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean, about 140 miles long and 35 miles broad. It was at one time a very prosperous and populous island, having 100 cities, and that may be a bit of an exaggeration, which is why it's in inverted commas, the character of the people is described in Paul's quotation as one of their own poets, Epimedonis, uh, in his epistle to Titus, he says, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now, that's no compliment to the people who lived in the island of Crete. But Jews from Crete were in Jerusalem. So we know that Jews lived in, uh, on the island of Crete, and they were in, in, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. The island was visited by Paul in his voyage to Rome in Acts chapter 27. And it's here that Paul then left uh, Titus to oversee the church. In terms of the message of Titus, the main purpose was to provide uh, Titus with guidance as to how to deal with local churches and local church leadership. They're obviously the false teachers, as I said um, just a moment ago. And then church leaders need to be carefully selected and scrutinized. Uh, it is in 1 Timothy and also in Titus that we find directives for the appointment of uh, elders. Um, and and you'll, you'll find that uh, in these letters as we look at the contents in a moment. The Christian life and the Christian witness should also take priority uh, in this world. Um, the qualifications, chapter 1, verse 5. He says, I want you to appoint elders. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe, are not open to charge or being wild. Uh, since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless. A similar kind of listing that you get in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so if you want to read something in the book of Titus, then I suggest that particular passage, as well as the practical guidelines in chapter 2. You must teach what is in court, what is in accord with sound doctrine. And by the way, this, the word sound doctrine is the direct opposite to false doctrine. So anything that is false needs to be countered by sound doctrine. And Paul says, I'm giving you sound doctrine. For us today, sound doctrine is found in the Word of God. Um, and as he goes on, in that particular section, he talks about older men, older women, younger men and younger women. Um, and every time, he says, you must help them and teach them to live in such a way that the gospel um, uh, is, is, is helped and the, the, the gospel is, um, um, is enhanced through our daily living. Uh, and and uh, just to give you an example of that, he says, uh, likewise teach older women to be reverent in verse 3. Uh, then they can train younger women, and so on and so on, so that no one will malign the Word of God in chapter, five, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, the second half. And then he talks about young men, and again he says you must teach them soundness of speech and so on, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So it is about living in such a way in this world, in this community, that people can't lay a finger on us and say, yeah, just look at what those Christians are doing. They're living immoral or unethical lives. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary, we should live lives that are attractive and would attract people to the gospel, is essentially what Paul is saying uh, to Titus. Some of the questions that I think we can uh, look at and consider as we come to an end uh, tonight. What are the false doctrines that we are facing today and how do we deal with them? Uh, we have some 
very clear directives here in Timothy and Titus more specifically. Do we truly uh, apply the requirements and qualifications for elders and deacons? And how do we deal with the guidelines uh, in terms of male, female, or genders? Um, is it different today? Is it the same now? That is the whole debate that I referred to, on, uh, referred to earlier on. What do we learn about social responsibility of the church? The uh, lot that Paul says about poor people and looking after the widows and so on. Those were the examples of poor people in those days. Uh, poor people in our days may look very different to what they looked like uh, back then, but still, the poor is, is still with us, and how do, we, how do we deal with that in terms of, of our approach? And then, uh, a, an interesting question, Paul circumcised Timothy, and I think I made a comment about that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Paul did that um, with Timothy, but he didn't do it with Titus. So it's an interesting debate. Why did Paul circumcise Timothy and not Titus. And the interesting thing is that he did it with Timothy after the council in Jerusalem where the, the direct decision was, the clear decision was, it is not necessary to have people circumcised in order to become Christian. Well, as we looked at it last time, uh, Timothy was circumcised by Paul because Timothy became a co-worker who entered into the Jewish synagogues with the Apostle Paul. Now, that same requirement does not seem to have applied to Titus. Uh, Titus seemed to have had a more of a Gentile approach or a Gentile uh, audience uh, that he approached. And so Paul never took him inside synagogues, and therefore there was no need for Titus to be circumcised. And um, it, it, does, it does create the question in our minds about wisdom in certain cases. Sometimes we have to make decisions based on what is wise, not necessarily what is precisely right, but what is wise. There's a difference between what is right and what is wise in, in uh, other circumstances. It brings us to the end of our lecture. Next time we're going to look at uh, Philemon, the book of Hebrews, and the book of James. And uh, with Philemon, we'll come to the end of the Pauline letters as well. So enjoy your week, and I trust that you will uh, survive the next week. <laughs>